let's give God a great big hand clap of praise. For God is worthy to be praised. How, how many know that God is worthy? Let us give God a great big, another great big hand clap of praise. Oh, that's all right for me. But let's give God a great big hand of praise. Hallelujah. We bless God for who God is. We Thank God for being God and being God alone. We certainly give homage uh, to the pastor who has served here for so long, Reverend Bonner, amen. Amen, I'm just one who believes in giving honor where honor is due. Uh, we thank God for Reverend Armstrong, who's carrying on, and thank God for Reverend Hardin, Reverend Davis, Reverend Willis, Reverend Harris. We're just thankful, amen, to be here. We praise God for the leadership of the church, and we bless God for Chairman Lewis Gray and Vice Chair Kenneth Johnson, we we just blessed to be here. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of old school. I like to sing a hymn before I go. Uh, and if you would, I pray that the church would go with me. I'd sing it like this. I need The oh, I, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my I sing that one more time. I need the oh, I, I need thee. Hey, every hour, I. I need thee. Oh, 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 bless me now, my Savior. I come to. Lord to thee. God, now we pause to tell you again, thank you. God, we ask that you lift up your countenance upon this church. God, they are in need. God, they're in need of a shepherd. God, right now we pray that your Holy Spirit continues to fall fresh on them and help them to understand where there is no shepherd the 
the sheep scatter. God, whoever you call, we ask that he has a special anointing. But God, I stand right now in the need of your help. I'm standing in the gap for you, God. Now I'm asking you, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength, my redeemer, amen. 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 My brothers and sisters, I ask that you would go with me, amen, to the book of First Kings. Amen, the book of First Kings. Amen. Touch your neighbor, say, neighbor, it's preaching time. Granddaddy always taught me, he says, songs are good, but the word of God is essential. Amen. Amen. We ask that you go to First Kings, 17th chapter. And amen, I praise God for your reverence to God by standing. I know we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. We stand for the Star-Spangled Banner. And I think as believers, we ought to stand for the reading of the Word of God. And of course, I'm sensitive to those who can't stand easily. So for those who can't stand easily, take your seat. And we are blessed. We are blessed. The Word of God reads uh, on the 17th, amen, chapter, uh, the 17th chapter on this wise. It starts at the 7th verse. It reads all the way to the 14th verse and it reads this way and it came to pass that after a while the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land and the word of the Lord came unto him Elijah saying arise get thee to Zarephath which belongeth to Zidon and dwell there Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose, he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink and as she was going to fetch it, he called to her again and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but just a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in to dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord brings rain upon the earth. My brothers and sisters, for the time that we share together, I want to use as a subject an unexpected experience. An unexpected experience. My brothers and sisters in the world of literature, Oftentimes, authors use literary devices in an effort to capture the attention of their audience. 
For the skilled author is not only able to capture one's attention, but he is effective in keeping their interest. Therefore, in the burning pursuit of the ear of an audience, a plot twist is used. A plot twist is a radical change in the expected direction or outcome of the plot of a particular narrative. Allow me to shift to say that sometimes the author and the finisher of our faith uses the same literary devices within the pages of our own life's stories to capture our attention and uses a plot twist to move us from one level of our Christian development to the next phase of our Christian faith. As we walk to the porch of our text, in this initial saga of Elijah, we see that the history begins somewhat abruptly. In the 17th chapter of 1 Kings, the very first verse prompts us to who he was, his mission, and the completion of his very first task. Elijah's story begins with him telling an unrighteous king that there will be a famine in the land of Israel. However, my Christian friends, after the very first verse, we collide with a plot twist. In other words, it, after we get from the first verse, my brothers and sisters, it seems as if the plot of this story takes a different direction. It seems as if the author of this chapter wanted to direct our attention toward another text or another detail. What this particular piece, what the author was doing was trying to activate his faith. The second verse says, and the word of the Lord came unto him saying, get thee hence turn eastward and hide thyself beside the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. In other words, God was telling Elijah to move. My brothers and sisters, not only does God tell Elijah to move, but the Lord gives him specific directions. And brothers and sisters, might I share with you this, that when God tells us to move, we have to get on the go. We have to go quickly. We have to make haste. We have to go at once. When God gives you directions, you got to go right now. And he says, turn eastward, hide thyself beside the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And my brothers and sisters, the story of Elijah really does not start until he is out of the presence of King Ahab where he is hiding beside a brook where he is forced to exercise his faith in God. Ah, uh, I just stopped through here on my way to the mountaintop to tell you that sometimes God is pulling you out of the comfort and the convenience of the kingdom. He's taking you out of the presence of King Ahab and he's putting you at a brook where you have no, uh, you, you ha are forced to, to exercise your faith in God. Therefore, the text suggests that from time to time, God again seeks to remove you from your comfort zone. He orders you and he extracts you from the convenience of companionship. God takes the security blanket 
from over you and understand this God and so that he can share with you that God and God alone is our refuge and our strength. Sometimes the Lord has to take you to some strange places. Sometimes God has to take you to some uncomfortable situation. Sometimes God has to take you to some unnerving jobs and some unfamiliar territory in life to remind you that it is the Lord who sustains you. I'm preaching. Y'all ain't saying nothing. God is known for taking unlikely situations as circumstantial provisions for his children. In other words, God is known for working at the fringes of life. Brothers and sisters, as we look at the text, we look at uh, as God uses Elijah. Verse 6 says that the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and the meat in the evening. Now come to, come to class with me, if you will. If you come to class with me, we understand that a raven, <laughs> I, I'm in here by myself this morning, we understand that a raven is a scavenger. In other words, a raven does not come to bring, but he comes to take. A raven comes and he consumes dead bodies. But look at how God worked on the raven. God used a raven to bring him bread in the morning and bread in the evening. Can I talk to you for one second today? I want you to understand that God can change the nature of life so that God can bless you. In other words, God can change the very nature of a raven to bless his children. Y'all still not praying with me. David says that God can change your enemy into a footstool. God can do it just just for you. Jesus said in Luke 19 40 we don't witness the goodness and grace he'll make a rock cry out. And you know sometimes God has to take a rock and turn the rock into a praise team so that God can get his glory. And I share with you this, my brothers and sisters, that God specializes in things impossible. And he can do what no other power except Holy Ghost power can do. God can take your layoff and turn it into a lift up. God can take a lion, a creature with a carnivorous appetite and turn it into a cushioned mattress. Daniel was able to say that God is able. God is able to do what he said would do. You all remember, my brothers and sisters, the children of Israel with the precipice of their destruction. But God showed up just in time. God showed up just in time and he split the Red Sea so they could walk. Walk on dry land and their sandals didn't even get wet. I wish I had some help in here. You all remember Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. I mean, a Bendigo. You all remember them, don't you? They was in the fiery furnace and they said when they threw them in the fiery furnace even one of the soldiers got consumed but then somebody else looked over into the furnace he said look my brothers and sisters I see that there were three men in there but now I see somebody and that somebody looks like the sun In other words, you can go through, but God will bring you through in such a way that you don't look like 
Is there anybody in here that can testify that they don't look like what they've been through? Is there anybody in here in the house that can testify that they don't look like that they've been in an abusive relationship? Is there anybody in here that can testify that they haven't been addicted to drugs and alcohol? Is there anybody in here? text seeks to teach us that when we meet up with the uncertainties of life, when we encounter life's inclement weather, when we struggle with, when we struggle with troublesome situations, we, and when we are pressed with perplexity and problems, our faith move us from principles to practice. You come in here every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, so that your faith can move you from those principles to practice. In other words, we've got to get to a point in our Christian maturity that we not only hear the word, we are not only say the word, but we abide by the word. Sunday after Sunday, I remember as a child, granddaddy used to get up, the deacons used to get up, the mothers used to get up and say, may God bless the readers, hearers, but I never heard that God bless the doers. You've got to get to a point where you hear and you read, but you do. You do the word. Text teaches us when we meet up with the uncertainties of life, brothers and sisters, we've got to move from principle to practice. I remember I was talking to one of the old mothers of my church. She's 98 years old, brothers and sisters. She told me this, and this is grandmama's theology. She says, you've got to show it and not only know it. You've got to show it. In other words, you've got to learn to exercise your faith in God. I have come to the realization and I recognize the infallible fact that life is filled with peaks and valleys and time is filled with swift transition and in life everything might not go as we plan them in life but yet and still we've got to get to a place and a position where we we trust God to put us where we need to be. Sometimes on this short sojourn with the Savior, you have not only, you, 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 my brothers and sisters, you've got to make some unexpected detours and diversions in life. Anybody in here with me? Is there anybody in here ever had to make some detours on this rough and rocky road called life? There's somebody in here had to make a detour on the way they got their living. There's somebody in here had to make a detour on their significant other. There's somebody in here, I wish I had some help in here, had to make a detour in their church home. There's somebody in here had to make some detours in life. But what I share with you is the God that gave you the road is the same God that governs your detour. Every now and then, God places a plot twist in our lives. But sometimes we get to a place in our lives where we think that because we've run into a snare or a snag or a plot twist, we think that we are outside of the will of God. I just came here to encourage you on today Pleasant Green, that just because you've run into a snag, just because you've run into a little detour, it does not mean that you are outside of the will of God. That is just because God is trying to push you to a place of Christian maturity. You know, it's too much of the name and acclaim it theology today. Every preacher that I see, even when we look at TV, everybody is talking about name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. Brothers and sisters, every time I look, we've gotten to a place that Christianity is nothing but a slot machine. But sometimes in our life, God deals us a rocky road. 
we've got to understand as believers how to move through and deal with when there are times of uncertainty. I'm preaching in here if I don't preach no more. Brothers and sisters, we've got to understand that God puts a plot twist in our life sometimes to grow our faith. We, we've got to be able to understand that all of us in here, although we've been to Sunday school, we've taught Sunday school for 40 years, although we go to BTU and we go to Sunday school, sometimes God still will allow a little bit of rain to fall in your life. I wish I had some help in here. But that does not mean that you are outside of the will of God. Brothers and sisters, sometimes you can do everything that the Lord told you to do and you still face some bad situations. And I just want to share with you today, look at Jesus' disciples, the ones that were closest to him. Even though they had Jesus right there on the boat with them, they were not exempt from the storm. Oh, Lord. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that even though you love the Lord, you do everything the Lord tells you, you're not exempt from a detour. You're not exempt from a storm in your life. You ought to tell your neighbor, neighbor, I don't know what you've been through. Understand this. Even though you love God, you are not exempt from the storms. Sometimes God chooses you specifically to go through. Sometimes God offers you. You all remember Job, don't you? <laughs> Satan looked at Job, said, hey, what about, he said, have you considered my servant Job? And then Satan debated with God, hey, well, Lord, you have a, a hedge around him. And then the Lord said, well, I remove my hedge. And then he said, well, if you remove your hedge, I bet you I can make him cuss. Sometimes God thrusts us into those places so that he can grow us and show us who's God. I'm, I'm pressing on. My brothers, sisters, look at Elijah. He encountered a plot twist. And brothers and sisters, uh, verse 7 informs us that sometimes later the brook dried I just stopped through here to tell you today, don't ever get too comfortable at your brook. Y'all help me out here. Don't ever get too comfortable at your brook. You know why you shouldn't get comfortable at your brook? Because your brook has the capability of drying up. Whatever your brook is, if your brook is your uh, handsome looks, if your brook is your uh, 36, 24, 36, if your brook is your bank account, whatever your brook is, if it's your friendship, if it's your children, brother, it's just, if it's your status or your education, don't ever get too comfortable. It's your brook. Because your brook. It can dry up. It can dry up. Brothers and sisters, the brook was Elijah's essential source of life, but yet even after following God's command, the brook dries up. We must remember that although we serve a sovereign Savior, although we work for the wonder worker, although our devotion is for the divine deliverer, we must bear in mind that there is no guarantee against the dehydrating droughts of life. There's no exemptions from the storms. Our brooks can dry up. But allow me to encourage you uh, to the fact that while your brook might dry up, it does not mean that you are, again, outside of the will of God. There are times which God uh, leads us to the dry and the depleted brook to reveal unto us his wonder-working 
our brooks simply serve as a reminder for us to trust in God and not the brook. <laughs> I'm about to shout by myself, trust in God. Don't trust in your book. The, 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 the professor in Proverbs said, trust in the Lord with all of thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all of thy way. Acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Give me about five more minutes. And I'm going to rush with rapidity to my conclusion. Brothers and sisters, as I continue to look at the text, not only does he activate our faith, not only does he accelerate our faith, but if you look at the text, God assimilates our faith. God was not finished with Elijah because when the brook fell, God told Elijah to go to the Phoenician city called Zarephath. Zarephath means a refining. Sometimes God will send you to unexpected places to refine you in order to bless you. But as we peek into this particular pericope, again, in the world of the text, Elijah, we see Elijah, a hungry, hammered, homeless hero, as he encounters a widow woman, and he encounters her not by coincidence, not by happenstance, not by accident or stroke of luck, but he encounters us, he encounters her, because God was trying to teach us something. Let me pause parenthetically to say that sometimes God has a tendency to show up at the bottom of the ninth inning with two outs and two strikes. But God, when it shows up, he's right on time. I'm going on to my close, but as I look at this, Elijah acts uh, a demanding requisition upon this woman. He says, fetch me. I pray thee, a little bread in my hand and a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And she was going to fetch it, but she thought about it for a minute. She said, hey, man, look, wait a minute. I have only just a little bit of oil in a cruise. And I just have a little meal in a barrel. And I'm going as the God liveth. I have not a cake, but I'm going to dress it for me and my son that we might eat it and die. She already told Elijah that I don't have enough to make it to the next day. She already told him her food stamps had run out. Her EBT card was insufficient. Her debit card was overdrawn with outstanding overdraft fees. She told him that I'm out of luck with no bucks. But he started exercising his faith to such a, a degree that it began to rub off. That's what I'm talking about. Assimilate simply means to rub off. It began to rub off on those who are around her. What are you talking about, Reverend Letcher? Well, let me share with you a piece about this Zarephath woman. You know Zarephath is a city in Phoenicia. In other words, this Zarephath woman, she was a Phoenician woman. I'm trying to still come get you. Well, what I'm sharing with you is, brothers and sisters, you all remember Phoenician women, don't you? Do, do y'all remember Phoenician women? Y'all remember Jezebel, don't you? Jezebel was a Phoenician woman. In other words, Je Phoenician women, they didn't understand or they, didn't, they were unfamiliar with who his God was. They worshiped the God of her dad, the God of Baal, and the God of Shamash. So they were unfamiliar with who his God was, but he began to exercise his faith to such a degree that it began to rub off on the folks around. All I'm trying to say is that you ought to trust God. You ought to believe in God in such a way that your faith begins to rub off on other folks uh, around you. But uh, I'm out of here now. Uh, but I just got one thing to say. 
there's another plot twist that takes place in the text. Oh Lord, uh, he said, uh, you ought to trust in the Lord, uh, because if you trust in the Lord, uh, God, God will provide for you. Is there anybody here know today that if you trust in, uh, trust in the Lord, uh, God will God will God will provide for you but look at the text he goes on to say what God has done for him he goes on to tell her that my God is rich in houses houses and land he goes on to tell her that my God he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He goes on to tell her that my God is a rock of ages. He tells her that my God is a bread in a starving land. Is there anybody here? Is there anybody here know about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Is there anybody here know that the Lord has made a way when it seemed like there was no way? Is there anybody here know that God, God did it? Oh, Lord. But when I look back at the text, something amazing began to happen. A lady that did not believe in the God. In other words, she began to to believe in the God uh, of Abraham, uh, Isaac, uh, and Jacob. Uh, I want to share this with you. Uh, one hymn says, uh, God specializes. Uh, is there anybody here uh, know that God uh, specializes uh, in things? impossible and he can do what no other power no other power but Holy Ghost Holy Ghost power can do is there anybody here know that God is alright I got one more story to share with you on the day oh Lord there's another plot twist and I think it was the best plot twist of any narrative ever told y'all remember oh there was there was there was a servant of the Lord and oh Lord his name his name was Jesus y'all remember him don't you they were my Lord all night long they spent on my Lord oh Lord but the story didn't stop there all all of his friends they left him the disciples left him oh Lord and he got into Pilate's court and he didn't have anything to say they thought he was a king of kings but oh I'm so glad the story does not end there. They pierced my Lord to the cross. They nailed his hands to the cross. They pierced him in the side. They put a nail. They put a thorn across. A, a thorn, a crown on his head. And the Bible says that he was the believer's, the believer's choice. But oh, one Friday, he died, he died on Calvary's cross, he died, and the disciples thought that the story was over, but here comes the best plot twist, one Sunday, oh, one Sunday, one Sunday, he got up uh, with all power. Uh, anybody here uh, know that God is able uh, to get up uh, all uh, oh, 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 oh. He's all right. 
If you know it's all right, you ought to wave your hand. If you know it's all right, tell the Lord, thank you, sir. You've been mighty good to me. I just want to tell the Lord, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Shake your neighbor's hand. Shake your neighbor's hand. Shake your neighbor's hand. Shake your neighbor's hand. And tell your neighbor, you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. I'm so glad I know the Lord. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved. He's all right with me. 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 When I think about what God has done for me, I can't help but to praise the Lord. The door of the church is open.